I just want to spend a couple of non-scientific minutes. Um, I just want to, so first of all, thanks the organizers for inviting me, but also this is an outstanding uh, organization. I want to say thank Ruth and the staff. Just everything worked perfect uh, from a year ago when they invited us. So thank you for the invitation and for hosting us so nicely. Uh, second, I want to explain for those of you that are not Technion graduates where you're sitting. I was sitting 29 and a half years ago there in my first uh, ever classes at the Technion, linear algebra with Professor Berman. And he's so good, that means he's the only one that is better than Mickey at the Technion. So uh, I took linear algebra with him 29 and a half years ago here, linear algebra two with him six months later. Those that did their undergrads here understand what I'm talking about. So I visit the Technion about twice a year, once a year, twice a year, but I never came back to this building since then. So it's a pleasure to be on the other side, uh, but I'm not even close to what Professor Berman, Professor Berman got the best teacher award for life at the Technion when I was an undergraduate. So, so it was great and my talk is gonna have some linear algebra on it. The third is uh, I, nothing, uh, uh, the best things that happened in my career uh, was to work with David, with Alan Tenemann, and with Freddie Brookstein and my colleagues here. So my master and PhD advisor was the best that ever happened to me. So being in my first, in the same conference room where I took my first class at the Technion and chair with David, it's just a pleasure that uh, basically makes me for the first time emotional back in a lecture hall. But I was invited to give a scientific talk, unfortunately, because I think it's much more interesting my past history at the Technion. But I have to give a scientific talk or they won't pay my ticket. So uh, at dinner, I can keep telling you what happened in the last 29 and a half years since I was sitting there. And uh, I'm gonna talk about learning to cluster and classify so in addition to, as I said, for me being very emotional to be here, the first talk has to be easy. And so I'm gonna try not to do a lot of math. Uh, there's gonna be much smarter people than me uh, talking later, everybody, basically. You start with the least smart, the conference. Uh, and they're gonna present much deeper math, but I wanna try to make it very soft. There will be a couple of equations, as I say, being in this room, I have to present linear algebra or Professor Berman wouldn't be happy with me 30 years after. And this is joint work with one of my postdocs, uh, Chan Q. So this is gonna be the outline. I'm gonna introduce you to this area of learning transformations. I think this should work. And uh, I'm gonna just give us an example, two areas, subspace clustering and random forest. I'm gonna explain both, so uh, hopefully it won't be too, too hard. So let's start with the uh, intuition uh, in the area of subspace clustering. So one of the big achievements in the last uh, 30 years of uh, computer vision and image processing, and one of the big goals is to try to recognize objects and recognize things. Why is this such a hard problem? The hard problem is when you want to recognize a face, the face appears, the same person appears in multiple views, multiple lighting conditions. So life in object recognition, face recognition will be extremely trivial if you always take the same picture, the same face, the same everything. But this is always the same, this is the same person and we try to recognize. So what will happen if I manage to transform that face into something that is much more uniform and looks almost identical no matter any transformation that you make. Let me just illustrate another example. Same person, different views. What would happen if we managed to transform this person just by a simple transform to make that look always the same? Then the problem of recognition classification becomes almost a trivial problem. And that's what we're gonna try to do with very simple algebra. 
So let me just motivate, and those examples are true examples from the transform that we learned. So we managed to make them very uniform, as you're going to see later. Let me just now do toy examples. Imagine that you have data. There are these red points and these blue points, two classes that you want to be able to recognize. But the data is given to you very easy in the vertical axis, in the horizontal axis, no noise. So you want to learn a transform that does nothing. Because this is almost an ideal situation. They are separated the maximum possible, and they stay on a plane. If your data is given like here, then you want to try to open that plane so when noise arrives, it just doesn't confuse you so much. So you want to try to separate the classes. When the data comes with a bit of noise and not having perfect angles, so you see that this is half pi, uh, sorry, this is about quarter pi, and this is the same, and there is a bit of variance, you want to try to open that data. So I'm talking in a supervised case. And you want to try to reduce the variance so you might be able to see that the transform that we are going to learn in a second managed to produce the data at the optimal angle, which is half pi. So it just managed to separate the best. And this is what we will have to be able to do. So let's just illustrate one possibility of doing that. And I'm going to start with a pedagogic formulation that you cannot solve, but I think it's good to illustrate the idea. And once again, just for illustration purposes, we have labels on our classes for the moment, so I'm only talking about supervised case. And the idea is that members that belong to different classes should be separated. Members that belong to the same class should collapse. And that idea, algebra one, can be represented by what's called the rank of a matrix. So let me illustrate that. We have C classes, and we take the data in one of the classes, and we put every data point, let's say an image, you put a column of this matrix. Forget about this for a second. So YC is all the data that belongs to class C, one data point as a column on that matrix. This is a transform we're going to learn. If your data lives in one subspace, think about a plane, and remember once again, algebra 1, 29 and a half years ago, the rank of that matrix will be very low. If all the columns are identical, the rank will be 1, which is idea. So I want to try to learn a transform, a linear transform. All what I'm going to allow you to do is multiply your data by a matrix, nothing else. I'm, I, I don't know nothing else than this. I, I want to be very simple. So on one hand, I want to reduce the rank at every class. I don't know what's going to be that rank because I don't know how diverse your data in the class is, but I want to reduce it. Ideally, it will be one, but I might not get there. On the other hand, I put in Y all the data together. That I want to spread around. I want to make very diverse. So ideally, I want that rank to be very high, very diverse data. Okay, And you have to put some constraints here. Otherwise, it's easy to solve this with basically the zero matrix or something like that. So this is the whole, I'm going to replace this in a second, but this is the whole concept. You want to reduce the rank of data in the same class. You want to increase it. Those that come from machine learning, this should start ringing a bell with what's called linear discriminant analysis. That has the same two terms, but in linear discriminant analysis, you are assuming that your data is Gaussian. And although we learned that in our first undergraduate, uh, because life is easy for Gaussian data, uh, it's not all your data is not always Gaussian. So this is kind of a sophisticated linear discriminant analysis. Now, it's not hard to prove that this becomes zero when the data becomes what's called disjoint spaces. And that's pretty cool. And as I explained to you, this manages to compact because you're going to reduce the rank for every uh, uh, subspace. But this fails at something else. 
And once again, 29 and a half years ago, this, I explained you the intuition, but it's not doing what I told you to do. So first of all, this is not computable, so you cannot optimize for the rank. But even worse, this, and I'm going to go back to my slide, this and this have the same rank, two. So I don't manage to open spaces with rank. Sounds intuitive, but it just doesn't work. So this is a very nice intuition, but it's, you cannot compute for it, and it also fails to do the separation. So it will collapse, but it won't separate. So we're going to replace this. For those that don't remember, a rank is the, basically the number of non-zero eigenvalues of that matrix. So there is a lot of literature on replacing the rank by what's called the nuclear norm. And this is going to be our formulation. So rank is the number of non-zero eigenvalues. The rank is the sum of their absolute value. And there is kind of an intuition that if the sum is small, then probably there are not many that are non-zero. And for some cases, you can prove that there is a complete equivalence. So this is going to be our formulation. We replace the rank by the nuclear norm. For those are optimization people in the audience are already starting to get very, very upset at me because this is non-convex. And optimization people get very upset at people that present non-convex formulations. So I'm sorry, but you cannot get this. LDA is also non-convex, although you can optimize. I'm going to discuss this in a second. So this is non-convex. This is convex. So I could solve for this, but the minus kills me. So you can sh easily show that this is greater or equal than zero. And you can show that if your spaces are orthogonal, this becomes zero. So this manages to collapse and separate, something that the rank didn't do. So this becomes zero when your subspaces are orthogonal, which is very good. You can optimize this online. And your multiplication can actually be a, what's called a fat matrix. So you can start from an image which is 100 by 100. I can do a transform that is 50 by 100. So you can do, and there is interesting theory to be done there. And uh, let me just skip this. And this is a building block, as we are going to see for other problems in a second. Now, I'm not an optimization person. This is a non-convex problem. There is actually no standard way to solve for this problem. But as an engineer, when there is no standard way, you do what we were told to do at the Technion, which is you do gradient descent. So it's not completely trivial how to do, but it's doable. How to do the gradient descent here. I don't know if Nati Srebro is in the room already, but he's an expert in this type of stuff since his PhD. Although there is more in the PhD than most of the community knows. Uh, actually, several papers by other authors have been written about his PhD already uh, without knowing that he was already in his PhD, but he's an expert on this type of stuff. I'm going to just do gradient descent, nothing else. So that's the idea. Let's go back to this example. We actually learn. We put this into the system, we learn an identity matrix, say do nothing. We put this, learn a different matrix. We put, this is the matrix we learn here. So it kind of works, even if we are doing a gradient descent, which allow us to do even more. So let me just illustrate a few examples, but I'm going to go straight to the real examples, uh, uh, so just to be on time. So this is the data I showed you before. Uh, there is two data sets, one with 38 subjects and different lighting conditions, the other data set with subjects, positions, and lighting conditions. And I'm going to just illustrate you what it achieves. Uh, it will be obvious that it works, otherwise I will be presenting something else. So I'm going to just give you intuitive results about the, res the, the results. So let's just pick nine faces from those just for illustration. Let's just look at this slide. Every color is one class of faces. Remember, faces have different lighting conditions and different positions. And then we project them into three dimensions just for visualization. And we start running the iterations 
of gradient descent to learn this transform matrix. And this is at the end. You see that it becomes extremely clear and clean, and it becomes close to 90 degrees. We're going to see, I mean, as close as it can in that embedded space. And it goes from you know, pretty bad performance without transform to basically about 5% error only. And here, I need to get away, are actually seeing how basically what I expected to happen is happening. So it gets better classification. But moreover, if we look here, these were the original angles between the subspaces. And you see they're pretty small. And after the optimization, they started to open up. That means that my classifier will be more robust. And you see the original nuclear norm and the nuclear norm per class after that. So this shows that I basically managed to separate the subspaces. And then I managed also to collapse the subspaces for the same class. And this is what you have to feed to your own classifier. I'm not talking how we classify. We classify in a particular case, but that's not important. We prepare the data for your classifier just by doing a matrix multiplication. I wanna, this is just a large illustration, but I want you to just pay attention here. This is the original data, and this is the transformed data. It looks to humans much less than a face, but they're actually very similar among themselves, much more than the original ones. And here is another example. So the idea is to, again, try to make the class very uniform. And that's what we saw here, where the nuclear norm is significantly reduced. And once again, and, and I think we try to run away from fights, uh, basically, I'm preparing the data, you pick your own classifier. In this case, we use a subspace classifier technique, but it doesn't have to be. So to illustrate that this can work on different classifiers, I'm going to plug the same idea in what's called random forest. So the idea of random forest is very simple. So it's one of the ways of doing what's called boosting. And if, if you don't believe in random forest or you're not aware, that's how Microsoft Kinect works. So the Microsoft Kinect does all the classification based on random forest. And you enter with your data and you make a very simple question to your data, and you go left or right. And at every node, you ask a very simple question. You go left or right. And during training, you basically say, what's the probability for every class to get to every single node? And you do that in multiple trees. You add randomness somehow. I'm going to explain in a second how we do it. And then when a new data point comes, you run it in parallel through all the trees. You get the probability, you sum those prob probabilities, and you say, is this person or is this position in the case of the Microsoft Kinect or these body parts? So it's a very simple classifier. It has been shown that converges to the oracle uh, when the number of trees goes to infinity under conditions. It's a very cool classifier because the questions are very, very simple. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to ask very simple questions there. And the question we're going to ask is we're going to divide your data in two randomly at every node. So if you give me four classes, I'm going to produce two. I'm going to collapse half of them, and I'm going to separate the two. You give me this mess, I'm going to produce two. That's what I'm going to do at every node. How I'm going to do that? I'm going to randomly say half of your classes are going to call them plus, half of your classes are going to call them minus. I'm going to sum their nuclear norms because I want to collapse them, and I want to take minus the nuclear norm of all the data together. That's going to be my decision at every node. And once again, a normalization condition. So just to remind you, we have a little bit of theory. It's very simple linear algebra to prove all this but uh, much more theory needs to come. So start from artificial examples. We have these four classes. We randomly say blue and cyan become class one, yellow and red become class two. We run the algorithm, and you can look at the 
angles, they became the right angles if the class, so here is before that and here is after we apply the transform. If you look at things of the same class like the blue and Siam, became almost no angle between them, but they have a 90 degrees with the rest. And if you do kind of LDA, it doesn't work because LDA assume your data was Gaussian and these are just subspaces. This is another example. We get this mess. We basically manage to separate them nice and LDA one. So at every node, we basically randomly, so we pick a tree. At every node, we randomly split in two and we learn a transform for that node and then we represent the subspaces with the transform, and then we do basically subspace projection to do classification. And randomness between, no, between trees, so this is the randomness at the nodes, the randomness between trees is simply, you use different data. So you have a million points, you randomly subsample 10% for every tree. And that's what we do. So once again, you enter the tree, you learn a transform at every tree node, and it's computationally very cheap to do once you have learned, because all what you have to do is multiply by a matrix, nothing else, to prepare the data. So I'm going to show you results, uh, illustrative results, once again in three data sets. This is what we had before. This is scenes that you have to say, is this indoor, outdoors, it's a kitchen, it's a living room, and this is Microsoft Kinect data. So, what I want to, so this is a, for the faces, these are our results. You get close to 100% correct with random forest. These are other techniques, but this is all random forest, but with different decisions at every node. So these are the classical decisions, and the performance is good with 100 trees. We get it with one tree. Okay, so this is 100 times faster. Modulo that minor multiplication, which I think is almost free. If you do LDA or SVM on the tree nodes, SVM doesn't do so bad, but it's more, relatively more expensive, not much more than doing this. So here you have the times. Okay, so we go from 100 trees to one tree, and I want to show that here. So this is digits, this is us, just a couple of trees, you get to state-of-the-art performance and you're already flat. And the classical random forest take a long time to go there. And I don't remember how many trees are in the Microsoft Kinect, but I think it's a couple of hundred. So this is the 15 since data set and this is the Kinect. We always get very fast with just a few trees because we are preparing the data. That's all what we're doing. So I was asked by one of the organizers to try to speed it up. And uh, as I say, I'm, I treat it so nicely that I want to perform. And so here's the conclusion. The conclusion is that before you feed your data to whatever you're going to feed and whatever is your favorite classifier, we love your classifier as much as you do. We just tell you, why don't you multiply by a matrix before you do that? It's kind of a feature detector. Uh, we, I show it in two classes, in subspace clustering and in random forest. And we only answer very few theoretical questions. There's many more theoretical questions from the optimization to this issue about how, what's the actual size of that matrix. Um, we have some simulations that we don't understand the results, uh, to tell you the truth. There is an optimal size that gets better performance, but we don't know yet, but we are trying with colleagues at Duke and, and at uh, University College London try to understand the actual size and it's actually related with mutual information and complexity and things like that, but we're in very early stages. And, and once again, I want to thank you and, and, and just remember the seat you're sitting is where many of us, some being here, where we learn our first linear algebra and I hope I didn't make any mistakes about SVD that I learned 29 and a half years ago in those seats. Thank you. <laughs>